Let's stand and sing together this morning. Though my sorrow and dead in my sin, lost without hope, with no place to begin. that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. I just want to sing this blessing over you this morning. The Lord bless 
bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lord, turn his face toward you and give you peace. with you in the morning in the 
have a seat this morning. It's, and um, you can probably tell we're having a, a Youth Emphasis Sunday up here this morning. A lot of youth. Um, I feel like there's an imposter among, there, we have among an imposter us up here, here on the drums. He's, the guy in the drums is acting sus over there. But, I think. He, <laughs> but he, uh, he said he's very young at heart. So uh, thank, you, thank you, Rob, for, for drumming on our Youth Emphasis Sunday. And... Um, so yeah, it's, it's exciting. You know, God is doing some amazing work here at David's. Do you know that? Amen. Um, I mean, just in our youth programs, in our WANA programs, in our Sunday schools, all that. Um, if you ever want to see something amazing, show up here about 6.15 on a Wednesday night and try and stand in that lobby and see people checking in. And uh, this past Wednesday night at Awana, I think what I heard, they had 99 kids at our Awana program. Can you believe that? And if I'm not mistaken, I heard that it was either three or four accepted Christ this w past Wednesday to want Can we just uh, give five. the Lord a great uh, praise for what he's doing here? We have, uh, I mean, just our youth program is just exploding and uh, lots of kids are coming out on Sunday nights. You know, people are ready to get back to what's important and that's being at church, being uh, in relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. And uh, so we just want to welcome, if you're, if you're new here this morning, maybe you're a visitor and you're uh, um, checking it out, we just want to ask that you fill out this guest connection card like Pastor Danny's holding up and bring it back to me in the back. I ran out of Dunkin' Donuts gift cards last week and I apologize to anyone that didn't get one, but we refilled and we're ready to go this week. We've got all of our Dunkin' Donuts gift card supplies up and ready to go. They had a rain check from last week, so if And if here. you were here last week and you didn't get one, come back and see me. We will make sure that you get one this week. And these cards are right in front of you in the pew backs if you want to grab one of yep. those. And yep. you can also, uh, if you are, if you need to, if you want to tithe today and you, and you um, don't have, uh, and you don't have the app, you can also, there's an envelope there, you can tithe, put it in the blue box in the back. But if you have the app, you can tithe on the app or the website if you're watching from home as well. I have one more announcement quick before you get started too. Okay. Is um, we are starting uh, practices for a Christmas choir. So we're going to have a Christmas choir this year on December 20th. And our rehearsal is, uh, first rehearsal is Tuesday, October 20th at 6 30 p.m. So if you're interested, you can come see me, let me know, or you can just show up, whatever works. But if you could come see me, that would be helpful. And uh, let me know that you're interested. We're trying to get our, uh, our whole, I don't know if we're going to get up to the 110 voices that we were hoping for the 250th, but we're, uh, we're growing our choir up. So if you have any interest in that, please see me and Pastor Danny. All right, I wanted to say a congratulations to Stu and Ella, Ellen Trevitz, who celebrated 65 years of marriage together on October 16th. So that's, uh, that's something to be excited about. I know you guys have been praying uh, for them. Uh, Stu is in the hospital with pneumonia. Ellen broke her leg. She's at home, but I know you guys have been praying for them, but now you can add a rejoicing uh, in your prayer as you continue to pray for them. Uh, you rejoice at 65 years of marriage. Uh, it's incredible, awesome. So congratulations to them. And I also uh, want to say we have, uh, we still need of candy. We need more candy. I checked this morning uh, and just to make sure. And they said uh, the bags are about half full of candy. We want to make the bags completely overflowing, full. overflowing, overflowing and if, with candy. If we, don't, if we don't have the bags full for next week, Danny and I might have to put together like a song and dance routine. We don't know. We're going to have to come up with something to, uh, to bring more attention to it. So if you could bring some candy out this some, week. No, we're not doing that. <laughs> no uh, don't, no please, song don't and dance us. routine, Just bro? go ahead and give candy. Don't make us do that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we don't want to be the known, known as a church that gets half bags of candy. We want to we wanna get full bags of candy. We so. want to be living in the overflow, bro. Yes, yes. So uh, continue to bring those in. Continue to sign up uh, for the fall festival. We still have... Uh, stuff we need donated and places that we need filled for that day while we're there. Uh, this is, I mean, Christian said we have almost 100 kids coming. Uh, we're we're going to expect a lot of kids that night, especially since there's not a lot of trick-or-treating going on because of COVID. They will be here and we will be an opportunity to, to bless our community and bless the children in our community. So uh, if you can, please volunteer for that and uh, donate to that as well. Um, on, on November 1st, that Sunday, November 1st, after the morning service, we will have a congregational meeting and it will be held to review the proposed budget for 2021. So if you're a member, make sure you stay for that. Uh, or you, even if you're not, you can stay for that meeting. But um, 
After that, we will also, on that same meeting, have a vote on the proposal of, consist a proposal of consistory to enter into a design-build contract with Pyramid Constructions to move plans forward for a new multi-purpose building. So you'll want to be here for that, um, to, to have the, the vote and, propose, and hear the proposal on that for a new building. Uh, we have, uh, we're running out of space here. We have a lot of kids. Uh, this will be, will be an opportunity. If you, like Christian said, if you, if you want to see the need for it, come here on a Wednesday night. Come here on a Sunday night and see what's happening around here. But that will be on November 1st. And if you want to hear more about it, definitely stick around after the morning service there. And the vote to approve the budget, that will take place at our annual meeting in December. So November 1st is just a review of the budget and a vote on the proposal for the new building contract. Um, and, and I urge everyone, especially young families with children, to attend, ask questions. Um, but and that only church members can vote on that one, but just, just to remind you of that. But yeah, you should plan to stay around on November 1st to hear more about that. Uh, youth group tonight, we're going to have an incredible youth group. Hope you guys all come out to that. Uh, you guys heard uh, some awesome music we have here. We also have that kind of music. These are a lot of kids that are in our band and youth group. We have that kind of great music. We have games. We have small group. We have awesome lesson and snacks. It's just going to be an incredible time. 6 to 8 p.m. if you're 6th to 12th grade. I hope to see you guys all here tonight. Let's go ahead and pray. God, I just pray. I pray uh, for the service. I pray um, for the worship that you continue to use uh, these youth to, to bless our hearts and to, to bring us into worship with you. And, and God, I pray, uh, I pray for Pastor Allen as he prepares to speak and give his sermon. I pray for open hearts willing to, to learn and, and eager to listen. And God, I just pray for changed hearts today. I pray this in your name. Amen. This is a song that the youth uh, have been enjoying. So they requested we sing it this morning. I searched the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough. Then you came along and put me back together. Satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. i 
surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone. And I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. And I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. chosen me your love has called my name I've been born again into your family your blood flows through my veins I'm no longer a slave and I'm no longer a slave to fear I am child of God but I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God Timothy 1 7 says for God has given us a not given us a spirit of fear but of power and of love and of a sound mind in our Lord and Savior, if you are a child of God this morning. Amen. Let's celebrate together. And I will sing forever of your love. Come down with my hands to heaven. 
heaven shout your praises out I was lost in darkness when you pulled me out I will sing forever of your love come down Children ages four through second grade can be dismissed this morning as, as uh, Pastor Allen comes to preach the word of God to us today. All right, as the kids dismiss, you can open your Bibles to the book of Acts. The book of Acts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. After the four Gospels comes the book of Acts. We've been there for a few months now looking at the history of the early church. Acts chapter 18 is where we are. Just to give you an update, last week was our baptism Sunday. We took a break from the, the chapters here, but I want to sort of bring you up to speed as we now get to the end of the Apostle Paul's second missionary journey. We just went through this chapter. We'll end Paul's second missionary journey. If you can remember that far back, uh, you remember that he started there in Antioch. Uh, he broke apart from his partner on the first missionary journey, Barnabas, and he takes a new partner, Silas, and they leave Antioch for uh, their mission trip into the Gentile world, eventually into Europe, all the way into Europe. 
Uh, it's somewhere around 49 AD. 49 AD would be the year that they depart on the second missionary journey in Lystra. They pick up uh, Timothy, who becomes part of Timothy's team, uh, Paul's team from there on. In Troas, they pick up Luke, who wrote the book of Acts. So along with uh, the Apostle Paul, the narrator, the writer of Acts, joins his team. God directs them through visions and other ways to go into Europe. They end up in a city called Philippi. And there in Philippi, we see three uh, conversions that are pointed out by, by Luke. The first is Lydia, a very prosperous businesswoman on the, the riverside. She and her household are converted. Then a, a demon-possessed woman who's, who's possessed by slaves. She's a, uh, possessed by demons. She's a slave. She's converted by Paul. And then lastly, we see the story of the Philippian, the Philippian jailer who is converted as Silas and Paul are in prison. There they are chased out of town by uh, a trial and go to a place called Thessalonica. There in Thessalonica they're accused and put on trial. Their main uh, accusation is that they are turning the world upside down. And they have to flee Thessalonica. They go to a place called Berea. Berea, they have a great revival there. The people of Berea go back to their homes and check the scriptures to see if what Paul is saying is biblical. The mob follows them to Berea. He's chased out of Berea. He goes to Athens, takes a, a ship down to Athens where he uh, witnesses to and addresses the philosophers of, of Athens. We saw that a couple of weeks ago. And, and lastly, we see him at the tip of Greece in this place called Corinth. A place called Corinth. So our story ends up here in chapter 18. I'm going to read to you verses 1 to 17. Uh, again, this is God's word for us today. Chapter 18 of Acts. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius, that's the emperor, had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. And he went to see them. And because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. And when they opposed, and when they opposed and reviled him, he shook his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your heads. I am innocent. From now on I will go to the Gentiles. And he left there and he went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. And his house was next to the synagogue. Verse 8, Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord together with his entire household. And many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking and do not be silent. For I am with you and no one will attack you to harm you. For I have many in the city who are my people. Verse 11, he stayed there a year. He stayed in Corinth. He stayed a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. But when Gallio, the proconsul of Achaia, and the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal, saying, this man is persuading people to worship God contrary to law. But when Paul was about to open his mouth, Galileo said to the Jews, if it were a matter of wrongdoing or vicious crime, O Jews, I would have reason to accept your complaint. But since it's a matter of a question about words and names in your own law, see to it yourself. I refuse to be a judge of these matters. And when he drove them from the tribunal, they, they seized Sosenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the tribunal. But Gallio paid no attention to any of this. We'll end our reading there. May God add his blessing to his word this morning. Let's ask him to bless our time together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray now as we open your word that you would be pleased once again on this Lord's Day to teach us, to challenge us, Lord, to, to, to send your Holy Spirit in power to guide us into truth. Your word is truth, Heavenly Father. May we leave transformed and changed people by the power of the Holy Spirit through your inspired word today. Be with our country, our nation, our leaders. Bless them, Heavenly Father. Be with those in hospital rooms and in, in uh, rehabs and at home uh, right now because of the danger of the coronavirus. Bless them, protect them, strengthen and heal them, Lord. Uh, be with the men and women 
uh, in uniform all over this country and world that uh, protect us, Lord. Uh, be with them. Be with the men and women in uniform that protect us and watch over us locally and around this world, Lord. Bless them uh, as they protect us, Lord. And Lord, bless us as once again we turn to your word, your inspired, never-changing, transformative word. And may today, uh, through your word, may you do a work in our lives. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Well, just to give you a little bit of context of this place called Corinth, okay? You can see sort of the picture there, the ruins of Corinth to this day. It's at the tip of Greece. It's the largest city in Greece at the time, over 250,000 people. And we could probably describe it in three words, three words that start with C to help you remember if you follow along in the app or you have your notes in front of you. Corinth was cosmopolitan, it was commercial, and it was corrupt. It was cosmopolitan, it was commercial, and it was corrupt. It was a mix of New York City and Las Vegas all in one. Sin City in the ancient world. It was the center of Aphrodite worship in the world. And Aphrodite is the goddess of love and lust and, and, and eroticism and sexual perversion. That was all centered in Corinth. In fact, the city of Corinth was, was known as being so wicked and perverted that it became an insult in the ancient world. If you were to go around, no matter where you were in the Roman world, and call someone a Corinthian, that was an insult. That would mean that that person was especially perverted and wicked. He's, he's acting like a Corinthian. Okay, so this, the city of Corinth was known for its perversion, known for its weakness around the world, that the, the label of that became an insult that you would call someone who was in great perversion and wickedness. It's a suffice to say that being a Christian in Corinth was hard to be a Christian there. And if you don't believe me, read First and Second Corinthians. There's actually three letters that Paul writes to Corinthians. We don't have the second one, but we have two letters in our, in our scriptures. And you read through those letters and you can see the, the way Paul is teaching and rebuking this church. This is a, a worldly church that struggled with sin from day one because they lived in a very sinful city. A very sinful city. It's hard to be a Christian in Corinth. That's why this is so pertinent to us and relevant to us today. And the books of 1st and 2nd Corinthians are so important to us because we are increasing living in Corinth ourselves. We can relate to the wickedness that, that they may have seen in Corinth, right? I mean, you just, every week you turn on the TV, every week you see the news, and you see the, the slide, the slide into perversion and wickedness in our nation. When you have a, a presidential candidate last week saying that if you're eight years old, you should be able to become a transgender person at eight. Eight years old. What does an eight-year-old know? And you're going to let them make these kind of decisions for their sexuality and their future life. It's, it's, it's crazy. We know what it is? It's Corinthian. This is the ancient world. We're sliding back. You know, we have been for, for, for generations, for literally hundreds of years, held in check by the righteousness and the goodness of the churches in this nation. But as the churches begin to lose their influence in this culture, we are seeing a slide right back to biblical times. This is what's going on around us. We can relate to Corinth. We can relate to Paul today as he goes to this wicked city because this is the type of place that we're living in increasingly. It's the context. We have a lot in common. We have a lot to learn about Corinth. So here's our hero, Paul the Apostle. He gets to Corinth, and I'm going to describe him with three words. Like Corinth, he was discouraged, he was alone, he was afraid. Our hero, the Apostle Paul, was discouraged, he was alone by himself, and he was afraid. He was afraid. Well, let's take him in order. He was discouraged. Another wicked city. In Athens, he was discouraged when he saw the idolatry. He gets to Corinth, it's no better, it's probably worse. So you can feel the, the weight on him of being the, one of the few Christians in this, in this wicked city. He meets new Christians there that are encouragement to him. But he, when he gets there, this is another city over its head, drowning in sinfulness. He's discouraged. This is a danger for us. As we increasingly live in Corinth and places like Corinth, we cannot get discouraged. As the people of God, we cannot afford to be discouraged. Some of you maybe are prone to that, to be discouraged. We have to fight as hard as we can from getting discouraged. We have to look to Jesus Christ and not be discouraged. But here's Paul, our hero. Even Paul got discouraged. Even Paul was human. Like us, sinful. And he, and he was discouraged. He was worn down. He was by himself. His team was not with him. Silas and Timothy, they were in Macedonia. They were traveling to meet Paul, but he's all by himself. 
pursued on the run. Every place Paul goes to, he is run out of town by a mob. His life is threatened. Every place he goes, he is persecuted. He is rejected. He is hated. That weighs on a person. Do you want to be hated? Do you want to be rejected? Again, the danger is the church of Jesus Christ in this nation is going to have to become more and more used to standing for truth and being rejected. We've had home court advantage for quite some time as a church of Jesus Christ here in America, but that time is over. We have to be able to, and be willing to stand and not be discouraged and to stand many times when we may be alone in our stand. That's hard to do. Paul struggled with it. We will struggle that in the years to come. And he's afraid. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 3, he's writing to the church of Corinth. He says, I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. Even the apostle Paul came to Corinth in fear and trembling and weakness. Because he's human like us. He's human like us. Fear. Fear has a way of seeping into our hearts and our minds. It's one, of, it's one of the devil's greatest tools, lying and fear. He uses fear. He's using fear in the church of Jesus Christ right now. He's always used this. And even the apostle Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament, the greatest Christian who ever lived outside of Jesus Christ, right? Started the church in Europe. Started the church in Jethro. Even here feels that tug into fear. Why? Well, everywhere he goes, they want to kill him. Everywhere he goes, there are mobs chasing him. He feels the, the burden of discouragement, of loneliness, and fear. These dangers that Paul faces are the same dangers we face, and these dangers can destroy the church of Jesus Christ. We have to realize we cannot be discouraged. We cannot feel alone. We have each other, and we cannot be afraid. So this is Paul's state of mind. This is where he is in a place called Corinth, the wicked place. This is his heart and his mind, where he is struggling when he gets there. So Jesus Christ encourages him. We're going to see through this that Paul continues his ministry in Corinth, but in this one place, unlike some of the other places, we see Jesus Christ taking a direct hand in, 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 in encouraging and strengthening Paul. Even Paul needed this. Okay, 40, in, in AD 49, he left Antioch. He's been, he's, been on the, he's been moving on the run for four years now. It's starting to accumulate on him, and Jesus Christ knows that. And we're going to see this chapter as Paul ministers. Jesus Christ is going to come alongside him and encourage him. And this encouragement is the same encouragement that God has for us. So I'm, I'm just going to look at five truths as we look through this, this chapter in Corinth and how God, in Paul's ministry, encouraged him. And this, this is how God encouraged Paul in, in, in Corinth and how he encourages us today, okay? First thing, first encouragement that Paul uh, receives from the Lord is, is other Christians, right? Number one, we need God's people. We need God's people. This is a biblical truth. All through the Bible, the unity uh, of the church, the unity of God's people is desperately needed. When times get tough, especially, we need each other. Do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together, Hebrews 10, 25 tells us. And it says, all the more as you see the day approaching. How many of you see the day approaching? Capital D, day approaching. It says the more you see it coming, the more you're going to need each other. The more you're going to need to support each other. The more we're going to need partners and friends and fellowship. The more we're going to need each other. The more we're going to need the fellowship of the saints and companions and co-workers and partners. And the unity that only comes through the Holy Spirit. This is essential. This is needed. This is why so many people right now are discouraged and leaning towards the scrimmage because they can't be here. Because of sickness. Because of COVID. Many people would love to be here, but because of the situation we're in right now, they have to be careful. And they can't come out to church. And they feel that when we're apart from each other, we feel it. We feel, we, we, we grow weaker, we grow discouraged. These things begin to set in. We begin to feel alone. This is why small groups are essential. This is why getting involved in a ministry here at the church is essential. This is why we've tried to provide, as best as we can, a safe environment here at David's. We have our balcony open for, for people that, that are still a little bit in that danger zone with their health and their age. We've, we've designated that place a safe place where you can wear masks, where we keep social distance. Because we know this is still a time we need to be careful with. But we want people here. We want church to be safe. We know how desperately we need each other. Paul needs other Christians. We need other Christians. God sends three groups of people to him to encourage him. The first is a couple, an amazing couple, uh, that he meets there in Corinth called Aquila and Priscilla. Look at verse 2. 
And he found a Jew named Aquila, a native Pontus, recently from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius, the emperor, had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. And he went to see them, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them. He finds a Christian couple who had been driven out of Rome, the Roman, a Roman historian at this time called uh, Setonius or something like that, reported that the Jews were expelled from the capital city of Rome because they kept rioting over a figure called Christus, which is Christ. So what, what, we see in Rome that Christianity had come to Rome, apart from Paul, but had come to Rome. He'll get there eventually. He, they, they, the Christianity comes there, and because the Jews hated so much, there was actually rioting in Rome, and the Jews were expelled from Rome. So that's the situation. So they're driven out of Rome, but they're driven out for the purpose of God, and they come to the city Corinth to become tent makers there, but they're also believers. They're an amazing couple. The first thing that we know about them is that they're married. This is a married couple, Quill and Priscilla. They are married six times. They are mentioned in the New Testament. And every time they're mentioned, they're together. Aquila and Priscilla, or Priscilla and Aquila, usually. Usually the wife is, is mentioned first. Let's say we Aquila here. And that's very unusual in ancient times that, that, that the wife would come in the list before the husband. This is a sign that in some way, Priscilla was much, of a, much more of a higher rank than her husband. She was known in some way. Uh, she was more prominent than Aquila was. And that's why she is normally listed first. But there's this married couple. They are a team. They are together. And they're mobile. They go from Rome to Corinth. They follow Paul back to Antioch. They go from Antioch back to Corinth to Ephesus. We see them throughout the New Testament, mentioned in many New Testament books. And they're always moving around the world, bringing the gospel to bear. This great husband and wife team that travel around as God would have them spreading the gospel. They're married. They're mobile. And they minister wherever they go. They're always ministering. This team, this amazing team. And, and perhaps because Priscilla was labeled first, she might have been the, the sort of the leader in this, in, in teaching. We don't know. Uh, but she, they both certainly taught. We know in Acts 18, 26, they teach Apollos, a great evangelist uh, in the word. They teach him. They, tear him. they take him aside and teach Apollos. Later on in the New Testament, in the book of Romans, in the end of Romans, in 2 Timothy, we see them opening their house. They had a, they had a, a ministry not just of teaching, but of hospitality. What an important ministry to open your home. Wherever Priscilla and Aquila went, they opened their home to people. They had church. They hosted their church. Romans 16, verse 3. 1 Corinthians 16, 19. 2 Timothy 4, 19. Whenever Paul mentions uh, Aquila and Priscilla, it's often as they open their house to the church of Jesus Christ. A, a fantastic ministry. This team that God is using, not just to spread the gospel, but in this point, to be an encouragement to Paul. Second group, his team catches up with him, Silas and Timothy. They come from Macedonia. Chapter 18, verse 5, when Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word. He can now be occupied with the word of God. They come to Macedonia from the, from the area of Philippi and Thessalonica and Berea, and they come down and they meet him in Corinth. And when they get there, they bring a financial gift, a substantial financial gift from, from Philippi, from the church of Philippi. And this financial gift frees up Paul to spend his time in ministry full time. In full time. We see this in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Verse 9, Paul speaking to the church of Corinthians. He says, when I was with you and was in need, he's speaking about now, now, I did not burden anyone for the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied my need. So I refrained and will refrain from burdening you anymore. There was a financial gift given to Paul so he can continue his ministry in Corinth. Perhaps for up to a year and a half. Again, as a side note, it's important that we as a church realize that we have a responsibility to support ministries and missionaries going forth. That's, that's why we give to church, so that we can send the money out from these walls to support missionaries that are around the world. Last week, we heard from Josiah and Ashley Yingling, who are getting ready to go to Southeast Asia. We want to support them. We are going to support them financially, because that's something that, that God has commanded us to do, to be supporters of ministries, local, and also uh, support international ministries. That's what our church is known for. That's what our church is known for. 20, over 25% of our budget every year goes to international missions. That's what we see here, that they are supporting the Apostle Paul. Philippi is supporting his ministry in Corinth so that he can spread the word. So we see an encouragement. Silas and Timothy, we see an encouragement from the church of Philippi. We also see the, an encouragement from the, the believers, the converts that are happening in, the book of, in, this, in, in this area of Corinth. 
Corinth Corinthians are converting to the gospel. Uh, Titius, Justice, and Crispus, and others are coming to faith. So here we see as Paul is in Corinth, he is discouraged when he gets there. He's alone. He's reunited with his, his friends to support him and encouragement through money and also through their, their, their own personal encouragement. He needs this encouragement and he thrives on it. It strengthens him. So here's my question uh, on this point uh, about needing other Christians. How many Christian friendships do you have? What, what groups are you involved in? Are you in a small group? Are you finding fellowship and unity in the body of Christ? You have to. You need to. You're commanded to. Hebrews 10, 25. You need to be continually cultivating deeper and richer and more intimate relationships in the body of Christ. We need each other more and more. The Apostle Paul needed encouragement. We need encouragement. So the first thing that Paul encourages him with was his other Christians. Secondly... The second thing that we need is God's mandate. God's mandate. And this is sort of a side point, but I, I want to make it an important point to us. That we need God's mandate. And the mandate I'm talking about is the mandate to work. The cultural mandate given in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28 and following. Look at verse 3. Uh, Acts 18.3. Paul goes to stay with Priscilla and Aquila. He lives with them. He, li he stays with them. And what brings them together is not just their common faith in Christianity. Verse 3, because they are of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked with them, for they were tent makers by trade. Paul goes and, and he finds work, real work, tent making. Paul was a tent maker. We use that phrase a lot of times to refer to missionaries today who go to countries who may be closed to Christianity, but go in under the, the means of a business or something. They're tent makers. But their real mission is to spread the gospel. Like the Apostle Paul, he, 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 he does tent making, leather working. He create, you know, he's, he's putting together tents and, and there was a big business for this. The Roman army and others lived in tents. So this idea of mending and creating tents was a big business. And that's what the Apostle Paul does by trade to support his real mission, which is to spread the gospel. He's a tent maker, which means he worked with his hands. He's a blue collar guy. When you look at Paul and you see how smart he is in Athens and other places, you look at him and say, well, this, is, this guy is a highly educated, scholarly academic. He's an elitist. He's, he's got the best education in the ancient world. He knows philosophy. He knows the, the Hebrew scriptures. And that's all true. But here we see a different side of Paul, which is important to contact, that, that he was a, a, a guy with calloused hands who knew how, how to work with his hands, a blue-collar worker. He was not just some scholar, ivory tower person who couldn't relate to people. He was a guy on the ground who could relate to everybody. And I think that's an amazing thing about the Apostle Paul and an important thing about the Apostle Paul. This is, again, why he was so effective in reaching people for Jesus. He could debate the philosophers in Athens, and then he could go to Corinth, and he could put together tents, and he could minister to people as he worked with his hands. Something about that, that that's a powerful statement, I think. Made me think of a quote by uh, Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson um, he had this quote. He said, I would rather be judged by 12 farmers than 12 scholars. I'd rather be judged by 12 farmers than 12 scholars. I think there's some wisdom there. And I, you know, I don't want to harp on this too much, but maybe we need to stop looking for leadership and, and looking for you know, political leaders or, or people we're going to place over us, so whether they be a judge. We're seeing a confirmation right now going forward. Maybe we need to stop looking at elitists that go to Yale and Harvard or wherever they go and have all the credentials. Maybe look to normal people, regular people. I think that's sort of the founding of this nation. I think there's a lot of wisdom in what Thomas Jefferson says. And I think this is why people trusted the Apostle Paul. He wasn't some elitist scholar, ivory tower guy. He was a regular guy working with his hands, working with Aquila and Priscilla. He says later on in, in 1 Thessalonians, writes to the church of Thessalonica that he just left, that he's been on the run from, and he talks about sort of a, a, sort of a brief theology of work. We don't have a lot of time to, to, to talk about this, but I want to give it to you so you, that you can think about how important it is to work and how that, that is, is something that is an encouragement, a strengthening for us when we work. We are made to work. Second Thessalonians chapter 3, this is in your notes if you're following along on the app or on your bulletin there, it says this, Now we command you, brothers, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who is working in idleness and not in accord with the tradition that you receive from us. Verse 7, For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us because we are not idle when we are with you. Imitate us. How? In our work. 
Nor do we eat anyone's bread without paying for it, but with toil and labor we work night and day that we may not be a burden to any of you. It was not because we do not have that right. We could have asked and you could have supported us, but we give you in ourselves an example to imitate, to work. For even when we were with you, we would give you this command. If anyone's not willing to work, let him not eat. It's a pretty harsh statement. For we hear that some of among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Now such persons we command and encourage you in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. As for you, brothers, do not grow weary in doing good. If anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note that the person have nothing to do with him, that he may be ashamed. Do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. that's, That's biblical, practical advice. Work. Work. Paul's discouraged. He's alone. What does he do? To, to receive encouragement, he, he gathers friends around him and he works. God made us to work. We will work in heaven. We work before sin, Adam and Eve, and we're called to work before sin entered the world. This is a good thing. This is something that we need to do as believers. It is good to work. It is commanded to work. Work is for all people. It's a calling. It's a vocation. You heard the word vocation? It's a calling. You are called to your job, whatever it may be, just like I'm called to the ministry of of, of preaching the word. My my calling is is pastor. Your calling may be something else. But all the callings are equal, and they all have the same end result, which is to glorify God. To glorify God. It's one of the answers I loved when when, uh, Amy Barrett, the Supreme Court that's going through right now, she says that that the ends, the the means, the ends of, of being a judge is to glorify God. That's the ends of all of our work, that we might glorify God. It is a good thing to work. And we see the Apostle Paul giving this example and working. If you want to live an unfulfilled, discouraged, unsatisfied life, be idle. Don't work. Don't work. That's what will happen to you. A discouraged, unfulfilled, unsatisfied life. We need to work. God made us that way. So the Apostle Paul gets to Corinth. He looks for good Christian friends. He gathers around good Christian friends for encouragement. And he goes to work. I love it. Thirdly, the Lord encourages him through reminding him of his mission. Work is not our mission. It's how we glorify God. We all have a mission, and it's all the same mission. And it's Acts 1-8. This is the the verse that steers us through the book of Acts. This is the theme, the, 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 the main subject matter of the book of Acts, right? This is the main verse of Acts. This is our mission. It's Paul's mission. It's our mission. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. Paul is at the ends of the earth. That's his part of the mission. He's going forth and bringing the gospel to the ends of the earth. That's his mission. That's our mission. So whatever you do, I don't care what you do, you do it for the glory of God and you fulfill the mission of Acts 1 to be salt and light, to be a witness wherever God's placed you. To bring him glory by your work and to be his witness. Period. That's for Paul. That's for us. This is our mission. This is Paul's mission. This is our mission. Again, you want to live an unfulfilled, unsatisfied, discouraging life as a Christian? Don't ever share your faith with anybody. Don't ever step out and talk about Jesus Christ to anybody. That will make you a a very unhappy Christian because you're going against how God made you. God wants you. This is your mission. Fulfill your mission. Work hard wherever God places you. Find good Christian friends and share the gospel. Very simple. But if you refuse to do those things, you will be a discouraged Christian. Things won't click for you as a Christian. You'll wonder why why you don't don't feel the presence of God, why you don't have joy, why you don't have victory over sin, why things are happening. Because you are going against the mandate of God and the mission of God. This is simple stuff. Illustrated by the Apostle Paul. Simple stuff. We've talked about this this method before, that, that he's on mission and he has a method for his mission. We've talked about this. We know he starts in the synagogue. Paul starts with the Jews and he branches out to the Gentiles. We're going to see that today in Corinth. And I've asked you before, but let me ask you again. What is your method for mission? What is your strategy for mission? You have the same mission Paul did. He had a very clear method. And God called him to be a traveling apostle, to plant churches all over the world. That's not our calling necessarily, but we still have the same mission. How are you fulfilling God's mission wherever he has placed you? What's your, what's your calling? You're a builder. So you're called to that, to glorify God through your work, to be a builder. But your mission is to bring the gospel to bear wherever you are. What's your method for reaching people on the job site, in your neighborhood, in your family, for the gospel? What's your method? What's your strategy? 
We have to think that way as Christians. The Apostle Paul was very strategic. We need to be more strategic. We need to have a method. Today I'm going to work wherever I work, and here's what I'll be praying for. Here's the opportunities I'll be looking for. I know my coworker likes to talk about X, whatever it might be, so I'm going to talk about that subject, and I'm going to steer that subject to Jesus Christ. Because that's what they like to talk about. And somehow, I'm going to pray about it and ask for an opening, that, that, that I have an open door to share the, about Jesus. That's your method. That's your mission. And let me tell you something. If you've never done that, you've never experienced the supernatural joy that comes with sharing the gospel. And if you have shared the gospel, you know exactly what I'm talking about. When you have a chance to speak to someone about Jesus, you leave that conversation walking on the clouds. You feel so good because you fulfilled your mission. You may not have done it perfectly. You may say, man, I wish I'd said this or I said that. But you are energized. You are joyful. You are rejoicing because you are fulfilling what God placed you on earth to do. Share the gospel of Jesus. You're discouraged. You feel alone. Go out and tell somebody about Jesus. And I guarantee you'll feel joy after you do that. That's, the, that's what the apostle Paul. So he's a method. And, and as he shares the gospel to Jews and Gentiles, we know that, that, that what happens wherever he goes, in every city, some, some believe and some some believe in, but most reject uh, the gospel. And he gets in trouble. He gets in trouble wherever he goes. Look at verse 6. And they opposed him and they reviled him, the Jews. And because they opposed him and reviled him, he shook out his garments. And he said to him, your blood is on your own hands. I am innocent from now on. I am going to the Gentiles. This is a Jewish custom. When you shake out your clothes or shake the dust off your clothes, it is a symbolic religious gesture that the, the Jews would do. And it is a symbol of rejection. He has rejected these Jews at Corinth. He has pleaded with them. He has reasoned with them. He has shared the faith. And he has only met harsh resistance and violence. He says, your blood be on your own hands. He shakes out his cloak and he moves on. I'm done with you. Wow. That that's, that's, doesn't sound Christian. We should never be done with people. Here's an example that Paul pleads and reasons and loves and shares the gospel and they continually say no. They can continually act violently towards him. He said, enough is enough. I am done. Your blood, your guilt is on your own heads. You've heard the gospel. You've rejected it. I'm leaving. Jesus said this. Jesus said this. Matthew chapter 10 verse 14. If anyone does not receive you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet when you leave that house or town. There comes a time sometimes when you face harsh, harsh hostility to the gospel repeatedly that you move on. You move on. We don't, we don't cast our pearls before swine. We give the gospel. We love people. But there comes a time sometimes that we say, that's it. Your blood is on your head. You've heard the gospel. You've rejected it repeatedly. I am moving on like the apostle Paul. We have to remember that the default position of the world around us is hatred is hatred for Jesus Christ and the gospel. Not love, hatred. They hate the gospel. They hate Jesus Christ and the truth of his word. We have to remember, that's what Jesus said. We cannot trick ourselves, like the evangelical church has to try to trick itself for decades now, that somehow if we just make the world like us, they will listen to us. That is a lie. The world will never like the gospel. They hate the gospel. And the more we spend our time trying to get this world to like us, the more we compromise and waste our time, and that's what we've been doing for decades as evangelicals, wasting our time, losing battle after battle, seeing the gospel of Jesus Christ wane in influence in this country, see churches begin to shrink, see false religions like health and wealth gospels and nonsense grow because their, their main operating, uh, their modus operandi is get the world to like you and then they'll, then they'll listen to you. That's, that's, that's a lie. If the world is listening to you and likes you, I can guarantee you, you're, you're, not, you're not with the gospel. You're compromising the gospel. Opposition. The world does not like us. They don't like our mission. The apostle Paul is reaping the opposition, the hatred, the violence, the persecution that comes when the world turns itself against the gospel. But that's not all that happens. He turns away from the, these specific Jews, but not all the Jews, because we know some of the Jews convert, like, like Crispus, the head of the, the synagogue, converts. So he doesn't reject the Jews, he just rejects this group. Because of their harshness and their rejection, he moves on and he sees a harvest of souls. Titus Justus and Crispus and others receive the gospel. The Gentile world receives the gospel. He witnesses and he sees great acceptance of the, of the gospel. He sees opposition, but he also sees acceptance. Stay on mission. 
This is your mission. There should be no doubt when you wake up tomorrow morning, whatever you do tomorrow morning, if you go to work, if you're retired, I don't know what, you're a house, you're a house mom, you're raising your kids, whatever it is you're called to tomorrow, whatever it is you do Monday morning, there should be no doubt you have a mandate by God to work and you have a mission by God which is to reach the world for Jesus Christ. That, that, is, that is in cement. That is, that is it. It's as simple as that. Go to work, work hard for the glory of God, whatever you might be, whether you're a student, I don't, you're a kid, you go to class, whatever it is, that is your mandate. And in that mandate, as you work for the glory of God, you are to share the good news about Jesus Christ. Done. Period. That's all of our jobs. Don't complicate it. Don't complicate it. It's right there. Wouldn't it be great if you woke up for work, for school, for, for, for babysitting, whatever you do tomorrow, that your first mind was, I'm going to work hard for the glory of God. And I'm going to look for opportunities to share about Jesus. Because I know if I look for them, God's going to give them to me. They're going to be there. God, Paul, is refocused on his mandate. He's refocused on his mission. He brings Christians around him for encouragement. Fourthly, God gives him, the, reiterates his promise of protection. Look at verse 9. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision. This is how we know Paul is down right now. Because we see Paul, Paul is, is, has, must still be struggling because Jesus comes to him and gives him these promises. Listen to what he says, verse 9. And the Lord said to Paul, one night in a vision, do not be afraid. Go on speaking and don't be silent. For I am with you and no one will attack you to harm you. For, for I have many in this city who are my people. And he stayed in Corinth a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. We need, to, these are, we need to know these promises. And, and, and let me tell you, Jesus is not opposed to reminding us again and again of his promises. He doesn't say, what's wrong with you? How, how many times do I have to tell you? I'm going to protect you. I'm going to be with you. He isn't tired of reiterating his promises. We sing his promises. We read his promises. We dig deep in his promises. We have to remind ourselves of the promises of God. And one of the most precious promises of God is that God is with us. God will protect us. God gives his promise to Paul. He gives it to us. Right? Look what he says. His two promises that I will be with you and no one will harm you. I will be with you and no one will harm me. God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit is with us. The Holy Spirit lives in us as believers all the time. And part of the ministry of Jesus Christ and God the Father and the Holy Spirit is to protect their people, to protect the people of God. Matthew 28, 20, when Jesus gives the Great Commission, Go therefore into the world and make disciples of the nations, baptizing them in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He says in verse 20, 28, 20, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always to the end of the age. How are you going to do this mission? How are you going to complicate your mission? Very simple. I am with you. I am in you. I will be with you always. I will never leave you or forsake you. I am in you and I am with you. I will strengthen you. I will protect you. My very presence will be with you. That is a promise that every Christian can take to the bank. That's a permanent, absolute promise that never changes. Therefore, if you really know that promise and you're growing in that promise of, of God's protection and provision and, and presence with us, we can live fearlessly. We have nothing to fear. Think about it. The God of the universe is with you, literally with you, by your side and in you, with you at all times. What could you possibly have to fear? Nothing. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. If we really knew this promise. And we struggle in this promise. Because the world looks dark and things don't go like we think they should go. And our bank account gets drained. And we get sick. And people that we love get sick. And all these things happen to us. And we go to places like Corinth. And we're by ourselves. And we're discouraged. And the world gets to us. And, and Jesus Christ comes again to us and says, Remember, Paul, I am with you. I will never leave you, Paul. I will never forsake you. That's the promise he gives to us today. That I'm with you. That no one will harm you. This is a, this is, this is a temporary promise that, that God gives to Paul. Sometimes God gives us specific promises that may just be for us. There's a lot of promises in his word. But sometimes he, he goes above and beyond his word. He gives us promises. He gives Paul, for this time in Corinth, for this year and a half in Corinth, he says, Paul, no one's going to harm you. Because remember, everywhere Paul goes, they're trying to harm him. <laughs> they're trying to kill him. They're putting him on trial. They're putting him in jail. They're beating him with rods. They're stoning him in Lystra. They're beating him. The mob follows him wherever he goes. And Paul's tired of this. He's discouraged by this. He's physically, his body must be physically breaking down because of this. And he, and, and, and he gets to the end of his rope and just says, for the next year and a half, I'm going to protect you. No one's going to touch you. You're going you're to fulfill your mission here in Corinth and I'm going to protect you. And he does. 
This is the promise that I'll be with you and that I will protect you. Therefore, he gives them two commands. Based on these two promises, here's the two things, Paul. Number one, do not be afraid. Stop being afraid. I am with you. I will be with you. Do not be afraid. The greatest and, and most prevalent and numerous command in the Bible by far is this. Do not be afraid. That's the number one command given in the Bible. Do not be afraid because we are weak and sinful and full of doubt and full of fear. God has to tell us all the time, do not be afraid. And we fear, we, we feel free, fear sinking into our hearts even now, don't we? Fear of sickness, fear of COVID, fear of coronavirus, fear of riots, fear of this election, fear of where this country is going, fear of our own family, fear of the, the fears that we have over us. And God is saying again and again, do not be afraid. What's the worst that can happen? You could die. That's the worst, right? What's worse than that? And what does Paul say? To die is gain. They're doing you a favor. To die is gain. We have nothing to fear. Do not stop speaking. That's the second thing he says. Do not speak. Do not stop speaking. Do not be silent. Do not be, can you believe the apostle Paul was tempted to be silent? We, don't, we, we can't picture that. Paul's such a, such a brave, strong you know, guy. But, but he had that fear just like us. He wanted to be silent. Lord, every time I open my mouth, they try to kill me. They try to persecute me. They try to throw me in jail. I'm sick of it. Do not be silent, Paul. I'm with you. Don't change the message. The Apostle Paul had that same temptation to maybe take the hard edges, the sharp edges off the gospel. Don't compromise the truth. Don't be afraid. Keep speaking. And the result of this promise, look at verse 11. He stays a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. A year and six months. Paul stays. By far, this is the longest place he stays up till now in any of his journeys, right? For, for a year and a half, he stays there without fear, speaking boldly, winning many for Jesus Christ. He continues to teach the Word of God. He stays, he speaks. We have the same promises that the Lord is with us. We have the same commands. Don't be silent. Keep going. And we need to have the same result. We need to stay and speak boldly. We need to continue in where God has placed us, even when it gets hard. Even when it gets hard, and we want to give up, stay the course, stay, continue, speak boldly. This is not the time for the church of Jesus Christ to retreat, to compromise, to forsake the truth. This is the time to stand firm, even though we have a lot to fear, even though our impulse is to run, to retreat, to give up. We can't do that. We need to stand firm. And this is a prayer for our church, for David's church, for our church, that we would continue to stand firm, that we would continue to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, that we would continue to reach this valley and this world beyond this valley for Jesus Christ. And the only way we're going to do it is by not compromising, by staying and speaking. By staying in the moment, no matter how hard, how dark, how bad it gets, we stay like Paul stayed, we claim the promises of God, and we continue to speak boldly. We will not be silent. You know, David's church, our prayer is that we would grow in boldness, that we are not going anywhere. We are not changing our mission. We are not changing what God has placed before us. You just heard from Pastor Danny in our announcement times that our, our, our vision is to build a building out on that gravel pad that we put out there years ago. Why do we want a building? We want a building because we want to continue to reach this valley for Jesus Christ. We want to be salt and light. We want to be a bright beacon of hope to everybody around here. That there is a place in Millersburg, Pennsylvania, in the, in the valley here, that preaches the counsel, the full counsel of God. It's right here. And as we see churches fall all around us, we see, we see worldwide ministries fall around us, we see people brought up on charges in the news, people that we followed, people like, I'm not even going to name them, but people that we followed in the books that we have, now we find all this junk on them, we see the compromise around. David's church will continue to shine bright. Period. That's our prayer. That's what we're going to do here. That's why we want that building. And we expect the Lord to fill that building up and to fill this building up. We know that that's happening. That's what I want. That's the vision that we have, that we might continue, that we might stay, and that we might speak boldly. Just like the Apostle Paul. Just like the Apostle Paul. Right, that's a good word. That's a good word for us today. The promises of God. He is with us. No one will harm us. We're in his will. Do we need to stand firm? 
to continue to speak and continue to stay where the Lord has planted. Well, immediately it's put to the test. I'm not going to read this for you. We're running out of time here. But chapter 18, verses 12 to, to 17, he's brought before uh, Galileo, uh, Galileo, and he's put on trial, and he's dismissed from this. The point here is that God will protect us and he will guide the hearts of our leaders that are wicked to even, to even uh, protect us. Proverbs 21 one says, The king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord and he turns it wherever he will. Matthew 10, Jesus says, When they deliver you over, when they deliver you over to the authorities over you, do not be anxious on how you speak or what you say, for what you are to say will be given to you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. God is with us. He will protect us. He will give us the very words to say, and he will direct the hearts of our leaders before us. Again, we have no place for fear in the church. Doesn't matter who's on the Supreme Court. Doesn't matter who's the president. Doesn't matter who the governor is. Those things are irrelevant. God is in control. He's on the throne. And every single thing that's happening in this nation, in every nation, is according to his will and for his purposes. And if his purpose and his will is to pour out his wrath on America, then so be it. That's his will for us. He'll get us through it. He'll be with us. He won't forsake us. He'll protect us. We're his people. He protected Paul. And then we see the end of this chapter. I'm going to read it for you. And we see Paul goes home. Paul heads home after, after these years of ministry, five years of ministry. Verse 18, after this, Paul stayed many days in Corinth, and then he took leave of the brothers, and he set sail for Syria, home base. And with him, he took Priscilla and Aquila's new friends. He took them back to Syria. At Centria, the, the port of Corinth, he cut his hair. He took a vow. He took a vow to the Lord. And they came to Ephesus, and he stayed with them there. But he himself went into the synagogue, and he reasoned with the Jews. But they asked him to stay long, for a longer period, and he declined. He's on his way home. He'll come back to, to, to Ephesus in his next journey. We'll see that. But on taking leave of Ephesus, he said, I will return to you if the Lord wills. And he set sail for Ephesus. And when he had landed in Caesarea Maritime, Caesarea um, is on the map there. It's a port city. He then went, it says he landed in Caesarea. He went, he went up and greeted the church. And then he went down to Antioch. That's, that's not geographical. That's spiritual. To go up, if a Jew goes up, where's he going? To Jerusalem. He went up to Jerusalem. That's what that means. It's not named there. But he went to Jerusalem. He went up to Jerusalem because Caesarea Mar uh, Maritime is here and Jerusalem's here. So it doesn't make any sense that he went up. He went down to Jerusalem and then it says he went down to Antioch. Antioch's up here. So he had to go up. You can see it on your map in your thing. So he goes home. He takes a vow. He, he, he continues to, to witness about Jesus. He worships in Jerusalem and he spends time at home getting rest and renewal that he needs. This is what Paul needed. He started off discouraged. He started off alone. And by the time he leaves Corinth after a year and a half, he leaves rejoicing in what God has done there. God encourages him. He strengthens him. He protects him. And Paul ends up at home with Simeon and Lucius and Menea. Maybe Barnabas was back in Syria by then and he got to spend time with Barnabas. We don't know. But he goes home for rest and renewal. This is just what he wanted. So let me wrap this up with what we can take from this. There's a lot to take from this today, but let me give you five points that we talked about. Are you discouraged? Are you worn out? Are you alone? Are you afraid? Can you relate to Paul today? Well, this is what you need to do. Number one, spend time with Christian friends. Find your Aquila and Priscilla. Find your Silas and Timothy, your co-workers, your partners, your friends among the people of God. You need that. Spend time working, fulfilling the mandate of God that God laid out for us in Genesis chapter 1 verse 28. Work for the glory of God, whatever God has placed you. Spend time in the mission, in ministering to God, the mission that God has laid out for us in Acts chapter uh, 1 8. Spend time in God's word, grow in maturity, grow in, in intimacy with the Lord, grow in his promises, his precious promises that he is with us and will not forsake us. And spend time at home, spend time in rest and renewal. Spend time in rest and renewal. God has called us the same calling he placed on the Apostle Paul. He's our example. He needed encouragement. We need encouragement. Keep going. Stand firm in God's word. Do not be uh, discouraged. Let's go ahead and pray about that. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your good word for us today, Lord. A word of encouragement. As we look at the Apostle Paul who won a great harvest in Corinth, Lord, but came there discouraged and alone and afraid, Lord, we can relate to that because we feel discouraged today in many areas. We feel lonely and afraid, Lord. I pray that you would help us like you helped the Apostle Paul, that you would remind us of the promises that you've given us, Lord, that you'd give us those good Christian friends, that you'd give us that mandate to work for your glory and that mission to share the gospel with witnesses wherever we go. 
that you might give us rest and renewal, that we might be ready to stand firm in the days to come, that David's church would be a church that stands firm on your word and in your truth, Lord that we would grow in our boldness, that we might grow in our witness, Lord, that this church might continue to be known as a church that, that preaches the gospel, that stands firm on your word, and that young people would flock here, that, that older people would flock here, that families would flock here to hear from you and hear the gospel, Lord. And I pray that you, you would do that among us here at David's, Lord, and that we'd follow after the example of the Apostle Paul, Lord, and we pray this in your name. Amen. Let's go ahead and stand now as we uh, dismiss. One, one announcement I saw flash on the screen that we didn't get to, and that's that we are having a very special event coming up called Recreation. And it is a uh, young, peop uh, young people, it's a, uh, it's a musical uh, team uh, that is local uh, here from, in this area, and they're going to come out on November 14th. It's a free concert. You'll be encouraged by it. November 14th, uh, there'll be a love offering, but I know you'll be blessed by it. Uh, so put that on your calendar. Some more information on the flyer. Uh, the flyer. Oh, there it is. Look at that. Look how good they are back there. Boom, right up. So November 14th, uh, you'll want to you'll wanna make that a priority. It'll be a great way f getting ready for our Christmas season, getting into our Thanksgiving season uh, to really spend some time worshiping the Lord. So again, fall festival signups. We still need volunteers for that outside. And um, shoebox, grab your shoebox as well on the way out. Uh, but let me pray for us uh, as we go. Heavenly Father, I pray now that you would bless us and that you would keep us, Lord, that you would make your face to shine upon us, Lord, that you would be gracious towards us, that you would lift your countenance towards us and bring us peace, Lord. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. Amen.